everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted the secret to happiness or to heal from anything, then do we have the puppy, the pen, and the chew toy show for you. Today I'll be talking with Sarani Stumpf, certified physician's assistant, acupuncturist, and the author of a beautiful treatise on healing and happiness, the puppy, the pen, and the chew toy. And that's just what I want to talk with her about today, about the secret to healing anything and discovering joy in your life. That plus we'll talk about horned worms and tomatoes, saving injured hummingbirds, the importance of five promises made to your daughter, the power of a diamond mountain retreat, how to manifest a horse farm, why you want to walk a dog, any dog, and what in the world saving crickets and earthworms has to do with anything. (laughs) Gotcha. So welcome to the show, Sarani. Are you ready to shine? I am ready to shine. Woohoo. Woohoo. You got this dialed. All right. So let's let's go. We're going to go way on back in time. I want to go through the arc a little bit here with you. What was your childhood like and where did you grow up? Oh, I I grew up in Southern California, not far from the beach. Yeah. Uh I was middle child of five children, uh, had a very happy, easy, gifted childhood. I admit it, and I'm happy to admit it. Well, that's not a bad thing. (laughs) It's so wonderful. I I know now that it's so rare, Mm -hmm. and uh, I'm really grateful for that. Did you have a uh, spiritual component? No. I I lived in this material world mm-hmm. and I believed it was real and it was kind to me and my parents taught me, you know, do the best you can, you can achieve anything you set out to achieve uh and what you do to others comes back to you. Awesome, right? So there awesome. was that component. And it's like, okay, I believed it. I was a kind person. I was a helpful person. I was shy, you know, mostly. Uh, and and I, I wanted to go to medical school. Mm-hmm. And so at that time, you know, one woman in a class of 100 and 50,000 applicants, you know, it was really difficult. And there were certain things you had to do, you know, volunteer this, do service, do this, do that, get good grades, et cetera. So, you know, I did all of that. Mm -hmm. And when it came time, I got rejected from medical school twice. And that like rocked my boat and made me mad, right? Like angry. It's like, I did everything they said I had to do and still they didn't take me. Mm -hmm. You know, my fallback actually was to go to physician assistant school, which in two years more schooling, I was out doing what I would have been doing after seven more years of school. So in retrospect, it's like, thank you very much, universe. You know, you are putting me in the right, in a, the direction for me. I was very happy as a PA. And uh, but still, you know, angry and resentful that the world did that to me. Mm-hmm. But still, it wasn't a spiritual thing. It was, you know, emotional stuff. So uh, I became a PA. I was working with a physician who was very open-minded and had uh, uh, a large number of patients in his care that had chronic pain. And he, he saw very clearly that pain medicine and antidepressants was not really helping them. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to find some other way. And so he looked at things like homeopathy, uh, hypnotherapy, acupuncture. And of course, he took me along on that journey. And I was learning some of those things as well. Uh, The most impressive of all of them that I found was the acupuncture. Mm -hmm where when my first introduction to that was learning how to use um, a TENS unit, but placing the electrodes on acupuncture points related to the meridians that the injury or pain was 
on. So for people and who don't know what that is, and we had Dr. Norman Shealy on the show before, who's, one of who's my actually heroes. You know, one of the founders, if not the founder of the TENS unit. What right. exactly is that for people who aren't, aren't familiar? Right. So a TENS unit is transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, mm -hmm. which is a method of pain management where you, um, you stimulate the body with this gentle uh, electrical pulsation. And it has an effect on the whole system of uh, pain perception to essentially distract the pain perception. And in distracting the pain perception, you can cut off that cycle of continued pain perception and hopefully break the cycle. And over time, you know, you don't need your TENS unit anymore because your body's had a chance to heal. But meanwhile, Having a, the electrical stimulation is way more comfortable than the pain. So traditionally, you would just put the electrode above and below the pain and crank the unit up as high as it would go that you could stand yeah. and mask the pain. But a brilliant uh, physical therapist that I met here in Tucson named Ken Lamb had the insight to try putting those electrodes on acupuncture points instead, because acupuncture points are areas of decreased electrical resistance in the skin so that you could use a much lower level of electrical stimulation and get the same result was the theory. But in fact, you got better results because not only did the pain get managed, mm -hmm. but anything related to the imbalance in that meridian got managed as well. So I'd be doing... Uh, elect electrical work yeah. with people and they'd say, oh, my headaches are better, but you know what? I'm getting along with my mother-in-law better. You know, my emotions are better. My bowels are moving better. Like all these other things that I didn't even know they were having trouble with because I was just dealing with their pain. And it's like it caught my attention. Ooh, there's something going on here. And so I went on and received some uh, acupuncture training and as a physician assistant, you mm -hmm. can get on your job description, whatever your physician is able to do. So we both got trained in acupuncture. I got it added to my job description, and it just took over my life. I, I realized more and more that the prescriptions I was writing as a PA, you know, I was doing my job, what I was supposed to do, but I wasn't really helping people with that. And that the tool I had to help people was acupuncture. I'm remembering now back, having flashbacks, almost started crying, myself laying on the table after my first NDE. And, and I, I looked like Neo <laughs> just coming out of the matrix. I was so, they counted over 100 needles one point as they're trying to rebuild my body. <laughs> And this Beautiful. was a Taiwanese acupuncturist who specialized in, and you're probably familiar with this, large gauge needles. <laughs> I didn't use large gauge. Oh. Most people don't. I know. <laughs> but it was part of my rebuilding wow. process. So, and, and Norm, Norm Shealy, he's, he's definitely one of my heroes, all time heroes, too. He is awesome, awesome, awesome. There's some irony here. I'm not sure when it started. But but it's often said that the, and I'm not sure why it's said, although I've seen this myself, that the healer cannot heal him or herself. When did your headaches and your other aches and pains start yourself? Okay, so in this process of, you know, my, I didn't even see it as a shift. I was just learning acupuncture to help my patients better. Mm -hmm. And in this same course, from like the period of time of starting PA school and then onward, you know, I was, I had had a neck injury. I was starting to get a stiff neck and then I was starting to get some lower back pain. And then, you know, all my joints got stiff and sore. And then I realized that the only way I could feel good was to keep moving. As soon as I stopped, I would like gel. And then to get going again, it just felt like I was 90 years old all the time, even though I was only in my twenties. And, you know, when I had, I had patients, I worked at a, for a while in a geriatric community 
And, you know, they'd all say, oh, you know, when I sit still for too long, it hurts so bad to get going. But once I get going, it's better. And I think to myself, oh, my gosh, I've got that. <laughs> you know, it's like, I've got that, too. Yeah. I've got that, too. You know, I didn't have the heart disease, but I seem to have all those same aches and pains. So it was growing on me. And uh, that was back before they even had this term fibromyalgia. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, knowing that I knew that I had symptoms that if I took myself to a doctor, they'd say, oh, you know, we can't find anything wrong with you. I never did take myself to anybody. I just looked for all these other answers. So meanwhile, mm, I had an experience that, um, you know, directly ripped the fabric of my material world and showed me that there is, in fact, a reality beyond the material. Do you mind if I but, ask what that was? Oh, you know, it's a long story. But the short version is my parents, who were David and my best friends, mm -hmm. they, they had their own small plane. They would fly from Los Angeles to Tucson one weekend a month, and we would play like kids, and then they'd fly home. So they were supposed to come. They didn't come. They went on a different trip. Their plane crashed. Uh, in the ocean, there was nothing recovered. But the day later, my mother's necklace, mm -hmm. on which hung a gold nugget that she dearly cherished and never took off, was hanging in my bathroom. And, you know, how did it get there? How did it get there? And that just, like, that was not in my reality that that was possible. And I had nothing to fall back on. It was like, I couldn't go, oh, you know, my mother was thinking of me when she died. It's like, I didn't have any of that. I was left in this black hole, you know, just falling in into nothing because what I thought was real was not, mm -hmm. but I didn't have anything else. So long story short, I landed in, in theosophy, uh, and there happened to be a study group right here in Tucson. And this beautiful study group, Jean and Joe Gulo and others, they just caught me and taught me, you know, things about the non-material world that I realized then I was remembering. It wasn't like new material. It was like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And one of the things was, you know, what's on your mind at the moment of death happens. You know, now fast forward, I really know what that means. But then it was like, oh, you know, my mother was thinking of me wanting me to have her gold nugget when her plane was crashing. And it's like, my, you know, there are more important things to think about when you're dying. But it was, I see now, it was all for my benefit because it opened this huge doorway uh, into reality that I otherwise, you know, it was there in front of my face with acupuncture, but I just wasn't getting it. And so that, you know, that was a long journey, but in it, I was searching for answers to that. I was searching then for how could it be that nobody would have to go through the kind of experience I went through to learn that lesson? Yeah. You know, can't we, can't we just know that stuff? Right? Can't we be born knowing that stuff? Ooh, and unless then, we are uh, born knowing and then we're taught yeah. that it's something else. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. And, uh, uh, and, and, and I was trying to use what I learned always to help my patients, but motivated because I had all those same pains too. Mm -hmm. yeah? So again, it's like I'm grateful for those, that fibromyalgia that, you know, was so horrible but not so horrible that I had to quit working, but not completely. So, so fast forward again, I'm finally realizing that Western medicine is not where I can best serve, but I'm not brave enough to just quit. So, you know, my job got taken away from me when I already was, you know, middle-aged. I had a, my own patients of a thousand or so patients and I thought, okay, I'll just take my patients with me and go find another job. And I couldn't, you know, that the medical world in Tucson at that time was, yeah, we'd love to hire you, but we don't want all your thousand patients. Is that crazy? Weird. It's like, 
you cost too much and you have too many people coming with you. Our practice can't handle that. So, you know, after a day on a mountain top, you know, crying my eyes out, it's like, bing, it's time to give up Western medicine, do acupuncture only. My supervising physician at that time was willing to continue as my supervising physician. Mm -hmm. And I just quit prescribing. I quit doing medicine. I did only acupuncture. And with each acupuncture patient I saw, I'd say this little prayer as I walked into their room. And I'd say, you know, may I know what they need, whether I can give it to them or not. May I just know how to get them the help that they need. You know, may I know. I say now that that prayer put me out of business because it brought me to my spiritual path, like full on. And that spiritual path took me out of Tucson. So I had to leave my patients. I couldn't do both my spiritual path and my business. It was before the days of cell phones and internet. You know, maybe I could do it now, but back then I had to choose. And uh, my choice took me out of Tucson, uh, out into the mountains of the Chiricahuas in southern Arizona to help build a center where, <laughs> right, exactly, where our. Uh, where our teacher would teach. Right? And so David fortunately joined me mm-hmm. on that journey. And uh, we spent 12 years out there in a very isolated place, helping to grow and run this center where a hundred or so people uh, fine tune their training in, in Tibetan Buddhism, very specific uh, kind of spiritual path. But not limited to that. It's like what we learned there is applicable to life did, everywhere. Did you start with the thousand day retreat? No, that was the end. That was mm-hmm. like the dissertation of your PhD was the thousand day retreat. After we had completed all the didactic training, mm-hmm. you no, know, we'd done hours and hours of service. We had this opportunity to do our thousand day retreat and it was during that retreat that this book appeared, actually. It was during one of our break times, which mm-hmm. meant we were a little bit freer in our schedule. And, you know, I'd been studying all these methods and practicing them and teaching them to other people, but not in such a concise way. And one morning, like two in the morning, I couldn't sleep, and this voice goes off in my head. Same voice I'm always hearing, but now it's saying, you know, like take dictation. <laughs> and two days later, right, 48 hours, the main section of this book had gotten written. Wow. And, and then, you know, I shared it with some friends and they said, cool. And then I set it aside to finish the thousand day retreat. And coming out of retreat, that was a wild experience. Uh, I had the opportunity to teach this material that had become this little document Mm. to to three, three different times, three different groups of people, one group that kind of knew it already. One, two groups where it was brand new to them. And interestingly, I had thought that they would like jump on it and say, okay, you know, help us really, really apply ourselves to this six weeks after the workshop. And nobody did No. There was like no follow-up whatsoever. And even if I reached out for follow-up, they'd go, yeah, yeah, that thing about seeds is really profound. We live by it now. Mm -hmm. See ya. You know, that's all they needed from me. It's like, okay. So I backed off and just waited. And then uh, I had been involved in writing my story about the necklace as a chapter in a friend's book. Uh, called Acupuncture for the Soul, which Mm -hmm. is a compilation of people's aha moments in their lives that changed them. And I met the editor that that woman used, this woman named Jan uh, Henriksen, who Mm -hmm. calls herself a book Sherpa. I call her a book midwife. You know, she (laughs) totally birthed this book. And I realized that, you know, she was brought to me as the one who could actually help me make this manuscript become alive. So I had added the workbook sections at the end. I was gathering people's stories 
And I had my friend Vimala Sperber making those sweet little illustrations for me. And then Jen Hendrickson waltzes in and she read the manuscript, just read it through and came back and said, oh, now I understand why I do the things I do. So it like gave her something. So at that point, it was like, okay, if this book doesn't go anywhere further, Mm -hmm. it helped her. So, so let's dive into the book. But before we do that, um, you talked about this kind of being your dissertation, this thousand-day retreat, and your your husband had a very both of you through this had a very interesting experience due to a health challenge. Right. So, at the end of our thousand-day retreat, um, so so this little book manuscript had come together probably a year before and set it aside towards the end of retreat. uh, My strong, healthy, smart, tall, handsome (laughs) husband comes home one day and he writes me a note because we're in silence. He says, "Uh, I couldn't catch my breath climbing the hill today, carrying my tools. And it was unusual. And it's like, that's weird. No, we, Just wrote it off the next day. I really couldn't catch my breath going up that hill or even coming up the lower hill. So I checked him over. Anyway, long story short, he got very sick very fast. Within three days, his blood pressure was up. His heart rate was up. His heart sounded weird. I couldn't hear anything in his lungs. Something serious was going on. I didn't know what, but enough that we needed to send him out of retreat. Um. But we decided it was more powerful for me to stay in retreat than to go out with him. So he packed a little bag and walked down the hill from our retreat cabin. And that was the last I saw of him. And um, I was like sitting there in my room, just like checking out, what do I really know? Yeah. What do I really know? And it, it was really a profound experience for me because I really realized that I I don't know anything that I'm not directly perceiving right now. I assumed he got help, but I didn't know. And uh, I sat in that exquisite space for a couple of hours, really exploring it and exploring it and exploring it. And that was profound and it's too much to go into here. But the, the pertinent story is that uh, soon the director of retreat came up to tell me what was going on. And he, he explained that they didn't know what, but David got to the ER, they were investigating it. We would know more in a couple of hours, but he shared his story with me. And that was that he had been in the ER with his wife a few, I don't know how long before, months before I got the impression. And the ER said she was having a heart attack. And so they took her to surgery to do an angiogram. Mm -hmm. And while she was in the angiogram, this friend called our teacher and our teacher said, you know, think about all the ways your wife has helped people feel better when they were sick and be happy for that. So this lady had had six children and took care of her mother and her husband knew all the good things she had done to help people get better. And rather than sitting there worrying about what was going on in the angiogram, he was being happy for all the ways that she had been helpful and kind. And the surgeon walks out and says, your wife's heart, blood vessels, and heart are perfectly normal. Well, what were all those tests in the Mm -hmm. ER that she's having a heart attack? He goes, I don't know, but your wife's heart is normal. And that story was the message to me about what I was supposed to be doing while I'm waiting to hear what's going on with David. So that's how I spent my next several days, was rejoicing in all the ways that I know David had protected life. And when I started thinking about it, man, the list just got longer and longer and longer and longer. And I was just being happy. You know, I'm happy he picked up that hummingbird that smashed itself into the window. I'm happy that he used to feed the birds. I'm happy. And it was, it was just in words. I wasn't really feeling happy. Mm -hmm. I was scared, but 
it was enough to hold my mind on all those good qualities that I knew he had. A couple hours later, I hear he's got massive pulmonary embolisms, but he's safe. He's on the medicine. We're waiting to transport him to Tucson. He should do fine. And it's like, wow. You know, before that, I didn't believe that things could shift like that. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, conventional medicine would say, yeah, they got him on the medicine. Yeah, but why? You know, why did they get him there in time? Why did the medicine work? Why did they have the proper machinery to figure out he had pulmonary embolism and not mm -hmm. mistake it for a heart, for pneumonia? Why? So let's let's go from there. And first, first off, that is a woohoo. That is a woohoo. <laughs> so so let's go from there, and let's let's talk about maybe the basic premise of your of your book, which something that you were you were talking about with with these other people, and and they they took this idea and, and ran with it. The importance of we reap what we sow. Right. Right. No, we learn that. You know, I think everybody knows that, but we. We don't pay attention to it in the tiny details of our lives. Mm -hmm. We maybe think of it when something, you know, big happens, either good or bad, or when we're talking, trying to explain why something happens to somebody else. Oh, they're reaping what they've sown. But we don't understand it in the details. And uh, I feel so blessed that I've learned about the details and shared what I've learned about the details with others. And so it's become a way of life for me mm -hmm. to understand this principle of we reap what we sow. Well, I'd like to dive into that concept more and, and maybe what's the four by four. Okay. So when we learn about the principle of we reap what we sow, it's the law of cause and effect. And in this tradition, there are four principles to know about how that law of cause and effect works. Mm -hmm. And then out of those four come three other lists of four, which uh, give us one set of four, gives us enough way of thinking about these ideas that we can figure out for ourselves how to live by the first set of four. I'll get more specific in a second. The third set of four is how to actually do it, right? Very specific uh, method. And then the fourth set of four is when we realize the first understanding of the four, we realize that we have done things that we uh, regret, right? We don't want to experience the results of those. Mm -hmm. And what do we do with those? Is there a way that we can uh, neutralize those yeah. past deeds? So the four by four is this method of understanding we reap what we sow in such a way that we can learn to be gardeners of our life, knowing what seeds to plant and what is a weed, right? And what is a weed seed that we can damage before it grows into a dandelion? Beautiful. So the four by four. All right. Uh, so if we talk about the basic premise of this, we have, we reap what we sow, we're reaping what we've sown, we can't reap what we haven't sown, and we will reap what we are sowing. What does that really mean? Okay, so um, and I have to go backwards a bit. Please do. Um, and in the... <clears throat> The, and it has to do with the title of the book. Oh, yes. Let's talk so, about when a pen is a pen. <laughs> so in order to understand about what we reap, what we sow. There, so let's do this thing. You and I, Michael, are going to do this thing. All right. Okay, so, so like, can you see this thing I'm holding? I, I can see this thing. And right. I'll use the word thing carefully there. Right. right. So what is it that you see? So for, for those who are, are listening, officially, if you buy this at the store, it's right. a four-color pen, blue on the bottom, white on the top, with those little uh, clicky things on the top, and you choose which color you want to use. Sometimes your teacher or professor will drive you nuts by keeping <laughs> clicking one or clicking, clicking, clicking <laughs> as you're trying to take your test, or the 
person next to you will. <laughs> so not only is this thing a pen, but it's got that whole story in Michael's man, mind about this pen. Yes. Right? Just in this simple little thing that I'm holding here. So along comes a puppy. What does a puppy do with this thing? Yum, yum, yum. <laughs> right. They sniff it. They bite it. They chew on it. What's the puppy chewing on for the puppy? A chew a toy. A chew toy. Right? So what does that say about the identity of this object? It's so simple, right? Mm -hmm. It's coming from the mind of the being who's perceiving it. Duh. Everybody gets that in an instant. So let's go a little deeper. What if I put this object on the table? Mm -hmm. All the people, all the puppies go away. What is that thing then? Right? No perceiver. Universal gesture. Don't know. No identity. That's what's called no self in Buddhism. <laughs> it doesn't mean nothing. It doesn't mean nothing's there. It hasn't disappeared. But it has no identity from its own side, from inside it. So the question is, why? Why do those of us who see ourselves as humans look at this information and put onto it pen? And why do we see dogs put onto it chew toy, mm -hmm. assuming that dogs do that too? And I don't know about you, but I don't know for sure. But that's what I see the dog do. Why? Is that a result of a cause? So our experiences, mm -hmm. our results, everything is a result of a cause. That's like one of the assumptions. We talk about those three assumptions at the beginning of the book, because if we don't start with that assumption, we can't go the rest of the way. The three basic assumptions. So my assumptions... I'll try to remember the order. Everybody wants to be happy. Yep. Every, everything we do is based on that desire. Even avoiding unpleasant things is based on wanting to avoid the unpleasant thing, wanting to be happy. Mm -hmm. Second thing, assumption is that uh, every experience we have is a result of a cause. Yep. And the third is, so if we know the causes for the result we want, all we have to do is make the cause, and the result will come. Right? Is that my three? Everyone Assumption. wants to be happy. We must not know how to make happiness, or we'd be happy, or we'd be doing that. Every existing thing happens to us as a result of some logical, as a result of some cause. And then you just brought it home. The conclusion: if we want happiness, it will have to be the result of some cause. Right. Perfect. So, if we are not happy, it means we either haven't made the right causes. Mm -hmm. Or we're, we've made the causes and they've not brought their results yet. If we have bad things happening to us, those two are the results of causes. So don't we want to know what the causes would be for the results we want? Because without those causes, we can't get the results we want. So that's where we're going. The, the why... Do we see Penn and puppies see True Troy has to do with the causes that are in our minds that we use the word ripen into the result of this as a pen or this as a chew toy. A human mind and a puppy mind mm -hmm. have different results ripening into their experience. And that's what makes us human or puppy or chicken or whatever. So the, the question is, so how does that cause get into the mind so that it can ripen into the result. Mm -hmm. So here's my silly example. So here's person one, here's person two. Person one says, oh, I need a pen. Does anyone have a pen? Person two goes, oh, I have one. Here, use mine. So watch what happens. Person two mm -hmm. is handing off their pen 
to person one. Yeah. Right? Person two's consciousness recorder has just watched themselves give away something to someone who needed it. That recorder has imprinted in person two's mind the seed, we call it a mental seed, of sharing something they had with someone in need. So that seed stays in person two's mind, actually flows along over time, actually growing Mm -hmm. a bit, so that someday person two is going, oh my gosh, I need a pen. Does anyone have a pen? Is there a pen anywhere? And person one goes, I have one here. And boom, person two ripens the seed of receiving the pen that they needed. That seed from having given the pen has come to its fruition and they have what they need. Now, that's a very simplistic example because it's not always pens to pens, right? It could be help gets help or in any way. I'm almost scared to go down this rabbit hole, but I'm going to go there anywhere. Okay. How does this um, relate to karma or causality? Okay, so this is the explanation for how causality works. Right? We're talking about karma. I avoid the word karma. My teacher avoids the word karma because people think they understand what it means. Mm-hmm. And they think that it means fate or, you know, like it's some... They don't understand the details, but because they think they understand, they don't go asking about the details. So we don't use that word so that people will be curious. What do you mean mental seats? But that's what we're talking about. Karma is movement of the mind and what it motivates. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So it's like the way karma works, the way this concept karma works is that when we see ourselves do something to others, Mm -hmm. kind, unkind, neutral, those, that awareness of ourselves in action imprints itself in our awareness. That is influenced by all other awarenesses coming along until the circumstances are such that that one blossoms into its result. And that result is our experience coming at us, perceived to be coming at us, when in fact, those experiences are all mental seeds coming from us, from our own past behavior, as if we're looking in a mirror, you know, and what we're seeing in the mirror is actually standing behind us. But we think it's in the mirror instead of looking behind to find the result. Our experiences are the results of our past actions towards others. So l- let's let's jump from there. Let's talk about, if I'm not going too far forward too fast, Knowing what we know about seeds, how does this affect how we live our lives? Okay, so it, the seeds are definite, meaning that a kindness that we see ourselves doing, the result of that has to be a kindness that we see coming to us. We give a pen, mm-hmm. we're going to get back a writing instrument of some kind. We're not going to get back a carrot. As carrot seeds grow, carrot plants that make new carrots. We can't get a tomato out of a carrot. So definite. But that also means unkindness seeds are going to come back to us as an unpleasant experience. Seeds grow. So little deeds done frequently, when those seeds come back, Mm -hmm. they're bigger. The experience is bigger. So maybe it's one pen is shared. What comes back is, you know, lots and lots of different uh, writing abilities, like a computer maybe. So seeds grow. Third one is a deed not done cannot bring us result. If you don't plant a tomato seed, don't Mm -hmm. cry that you don't get tomato plants in your garden. Or if you have an unpleasant experience, Mm -hmm. It has to be a seed that you planted. It can't come from nowhere. But when we get in that car accident because somebody was talking on their cell phone, who do we blame? The person on the cell phone not paying attention. They were a contributing factor. 
It was our past inattentiveness that caused the car accident. How do we, one of the challenges with that and, uh, is that here in the West, we're really good at blaming ourselves. And so it would be really easy to take take away from this if we left the if we left the discussion at this point and said if any stuff goes down it means I did something wrong. Right. But that's not and what you're saying. It well I am saying that but I'm not saying that that means I'm bad Thank or that you. I should be guilty, right? Thank you for bringing that up. It means that I was mistaken. Mm -hmm. It means that I didn't understand about living by seeds and I let myself be selfish and unkind. Who hasn't done that? You know, we all do that out of misunderstanding. When we use the same logic, mm -hmm. look at all the amazing goodness that we have. You know, even those of us that are pointing out the bad things we do all the time to ourselves, we we have transportation. We have clean air to breathe. We have water running in our taps. We have the ability right, to connect with each other in this way and then with people all over the world. All of those are, are the results of our past kindness, our past helpfulness. Everybody that we see who has a car to drive, that's a result of our past kindness too. So we have way more kindness seeds than we have bad seeds. Mm -hmm. Our culture has just for some reason made us into people who count our negativities instead of count our goodnesses, which is what rejoicing practice is all about. You know, the bottom line is looking for the goodnesses within ourselves and sharing those with others. How do we start to do that? Because it's important that we, we start to plant some seeds here for our future. Exactly, exactly. So when we understand this principle, we come to see that our old mode of being is reacting to experiences mm -hmm. in this mistaken way, right? reacting as if they're events that have nothing to do with our own behavior. When we understand that these are results of past behaviors, we see that they're also opportunities mm -hmm. to plant a new experience in the future. So say, say we have a recurring theme experience of a supervisor at work who just seems to not like us and every chance they get, they yell at us and point out our faults. And our natural reactive tendency is to yell back at them. No, or to blame them or to blame somebody else for what they're saying we did, whether we did it or not, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. When we understand about seeds, we like zip our lip for a minute, recognize, you know, I'm angry, I'm hurt, I realize all that's happening, it's all true, but also thinking, oh, this is an opportunity to like weed out this seed that's ripening out of my mind and try very hard to uh, either plant no seed, which mm -hmm. you can't actually do, or plant a good one. You know, can I like just think, oh, you know, this is coming from my mind, just like the pen and the puppy. Can I say, I'm sorry you're upset with me? That's true. How can I set it right? That's, That's true, too. You no. Know? You're still angry. It doesn't stop their yelling. But what seed have you planted for the next time you yourself are angry with someone? Maybe not the next time, but some future time, you'll find yourself angry with someone and they'll say, I'm sorry you're angry with me. How can I help you? How would that feel? You no, know, it's like, whoa. When it happens once, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, maybe this stuff works. You try it again. Oh, maybe this stuff works. Finally, something happens, like my event with David. Oh, this stuff doesn't just work. It's like driving life. This mm -hmm. is what life is about, is becoming this creator of my future. Now, the difficulty is that there's a delay between when you plant the seed in your mind 
and when it grows into the result, just like in nature. And so we can't directly see, oh, this plant, this experience of the yelling boss is a ripening of this seed when I yelled at my kids a month ago. We can't see that because of this delay between the two. But we can understand it. And when we've had an experience of proving it to ourselves, the delay becomes a period of uh, fun. It's the challenge Mm -hmm. to see, you know, can I connect the dot and can I shorten the delay between when I plant this seed and when I reap the result? There's we a, can, in fact, get there. There's there's a, a song that I used to play a lot. I don't anymore because I, I couldn't find it humorous anymore. Uh, John Lennon, Instant Karma. Um, <laughs> and and Jessica used to joke with me that that um, karma would get me fast. If I, would, if I would say something bad about my wife, if I would think something, all of a sudden I would stub a toe, I would trip, something would fall on me. And she'd just laugh at me because it would be like, what's wrong? <laughs> it it's would, true. It's and, so true. It is so true. Can you tell us what, what's the importance um, and power of rejoicing? And, and what does that mean? Okay. So uh, when we reach this place of understanding about seeds, naturally we think, okay, so how do I live by this? You know, mm-hmm. How can I do an experiment where I can really, truly prove this to myself? And that's where that uh, four steps comes in. So the four flowers is about how things ripen so we can learn how to recognize. The four steps is, so how do I apply this? Mm -hmm. So to learn how to do it, we consciously apply these four steps. The first is decide what you want to see as your result. Knowing that in order for me to see that result, I have to find somebody who wants a similar result and help them get it. That's the giving the pen, right? That brings the pen back. So we, that's step number two, is plan out with whom you're going to run your experiment. Sounds very cold, I don't mean that, but it starts out that way. And what you're going to do to help them. And one of the things you do to help them is ask them to help you. And so together, you're trying to, Decide on some behaviors you'll do together that will help that person succeed in their whatever that task is. Mm -hmm. Third is you do what you say you're going to do, but while you're doing it, you're keeping in mind this idea about seeds and you're growing the power of the seeds imprint by thinking, if I prove this to myself, I can prove it to my friend then they can prove it to their friend and they can prove it to their friend. And pretty soon everybody understands about how to be the creator of the future that they want, not just for themselves, but for everybody. So fourth part is we can plant all of these seeds and they can rattle around in our consciousness for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. How do we get them to ripen? So if we plant seeds in a garden and then you just walk away from the garden We're at the behest of Mother Nature as to when those seeds ripen. And uh, we may wait a long time. But if we, the gardener, go and put some water on that soil and watch it and put a little water more when it starts to dry out, if we tend it well, we can cultivate those seeds to actually swell and Mm -hmm. send up their little sprouts and become the tomato plant with lots of tomatoes. So in the same way that we can tend the garden of our own mind seeds to remember the seeds we've planted, the good seeds we've planted and be happy that we've done that and be like, have that sense of joy and anticipating anticipation of doing them some more that, mental attention to those seeds that have been planted adds more seeds, more vibe to those seeds. And it it's like pouring water on the garden seeds. They sprout and grow sooner than they otherwise would have. Woo-hoo. Yeah, our culture has a tendency to do the opposite. We think about the bad things that happen. Mm-hmm. We ruminate on the bad things. And that strengthens the bad things and they come to the surface as well so the same 
the process is the same for kindness as for unkindness. So our power lies in this ability to to review the kindnesses, the goodnesses that we see in our world and that we see ourselves doing and take responsibility for those too and be happy we've done them. And that's what brings more goodness to ourselves and our world. Woo! Yeah. So let's last fast forward. And there's there's a lot here in here, everybody. So so go out and get the puppy, the pen, and the chew toy because there's there's a lot Please. more that we're we're not able to get into in, in just an hour here. But if we kind of wrap this all up and bring this all home, and I can guide you through this. I don't expect you to remember all five off the top of your head. Five promises to your daughter. Eliana Morris mm -hmm. is uh, a co-student at uh, this Diamond Mountain Center, and her background is education, children's education. So for her, the puppy pen and the chew toy, the, the little dog's thought bubble yep. says the secret to teaching anyone anything. So she has an entire curriculum developed based on seeds, mental seeds, for education, you know, K through I don't know if it goes through 12, K through eight, I know for sure mm -hmm. that people can reach from path-edu.org path that her story at the back of the book is these five promises that she made to her daughter. So let's go over each one. Stay positive. Right. So in the same way that you pointed out that people could take this information about seeds and beat themselves up about the negativity that they've done. She realized that too and does not want to raise her daughter in that mindset. So by staying positive, it means that whether there's unpleasantness happening or not, you have the power to create the seeds that you want in the future. So Staying positive comes from knowing that we have the power to change things. So even smiling when your heart is aching. Exactly. Exactly. Number two, have faith in goodness. Right. So this is what comes around, what goes around, comes around, right? It's the, def, the law of karma that seeds are definite. Kindness seeds bring a pleasant result, kindness results. And that there's no other way that that can be. A kindness can never bring an unpleasant result, even though in real life it seems that way. We can be kind to somebody and they can beat us up. Them beating us up is not a result of being kindness. Kindness will always bring a good result when we get the result of that kindness. It's the delay. So she's reminding us to remember there's a delay and be kind no matter what. Beautiful. Number three, honor your temporary truth. Yes. So when we're, when we're talking about the boss yelling and you're trying to hold back your reaction that wants to blast them back, we're not saying deny you're angry. We're not saying deny that you're hurting. We're saying honor that you're hurting. Honor that this is painful. And that is why you don't want to perpetuate the situation. Because it hurts, you want to stop acting in a way that will bring more hurt. You're hurting. You realize that that person who's yelling at you is making the seeds in their mind to be yelled at, and they're going to hurt the way you're hurting right now. Right? So it's, it's compassion, compassion for oneself, compassion for the other people involved in the unpleasant situation that allows us to honor I'm hurting right now. Right? It's okay. I'm not bad. It's just the result of seeds. Dandelions grow, seeds grow dandelion plants. If you don't like them, pluck them out. But it's not that you don't look at them. Oh, I have no dandelions in my garden. I, yes, we do. So honor it. Don't act from it. Thank you. Four, whatever you want, give it away. Exactly. So this is, anyone have a pen? Yes. Right. So we think that, oh, if I, if I want a new job, I need to go and 
put out my resume to 12 different places, and one of those places is going to be the job of my dreams. When we understand about seeds, I want a new job. Mm -hmm. I first go find someone who's looking for a job. Maybe, you know, it's the gardener and you haven't had him come do your yard in a while. You think, okay, I'm going to give the gardener a job today. Maybe we do that for six weeks. And then we put out our resume. You've loaded your resume with seeds of giving someone else a job. Beautiful. Right? Before we jump into number five, since you mentioned the gardener and you mentioned dandelions, if we have planted seeds, uh, weeds that we want to get rid of, you said pull out the dandelions. How do we pull them out? Right. So there's a four-step process that's very detailed in the book about how to, how to weed these seeds even before they sprout. And it, the, the first step in the process, of course, is to recognize that they're even there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second is to, real, to think back about the idea of seeds. You know, these were behaviors that I did, misunderstanding where things really come from. So before I understood the thing about seeds, I used to, you know, yell back when someone yells at me. Now I realize that's just perpetuating all the yelling in my world, my personal and everybody else's that I see. And, and I regret that, right? Regret is the sense of, I just made a mistake and I wish I could take it back, right? It's not guilt. I'm bad. I didn't know better. I can never do any better. It's just like, whoops. No, I goofed and I'm sorry. And I'll establish something to make up for it. And then I'll really work hard to not do it again right, in a very specific way. Mm -hmm. So we establish something to do to make up for it that's the opposite of that. So maybe if it's yelling, it's like, okay, and I yell at my kids regularly. That's now why I see my boss yelling at me all the time. So I'm not only going to stop yelling at my kids, that's my power of restraint, I'm going to do the opposite. What's the opposite of yelling at yeah. somebody? It's like praising them. I'm going to praise my kids. I'm going to tell them how great they are, you know, as often as I can to make up for all the times I called them stupid, you know, all the times that I berated them. I'm going to do the opposite. You're planting seeds that negate the ones that are already in there. It's like pouring, you know, herbicide, pre emergent on your garden <laughs> is doing the opposite. Right? And, and kind and gentle herbicide that doesn't hurt the earthworms or anything else. I exactly. Like it. Right. Personal pre-emergent. I, I like it. So so let's go for, for number five in the promises, which is celebrate and dedicate. Right. So celebrate and dedicate, dedicate is this rejoicing part in the four steps where you're adding power to the goodness that you've done to get those seeds to be fertilized, right? To come up and uh, not just the seeds fertilized, but even the plant to fertilize and, you know, grow bigger, beautiful, more beautiful flowers. So uh, it it's necessary to consciously be happy mm -hmm. for these ways in which we've changed our behavior. So in our example of the yelling boss and the praising the kids instead, on a daily basis, we would want to set aside some time, just a few minutes, five, 10 minutes to think, okay, I really did praise my kids today. You know, I remember saying how beautiful she looked or, you know, how kind she was at school. I saw her and I told her that, and I'm really happy I did. Mm -hmm. That's the celebrating. You can do that together. You, know, you can do that with each other. She could do her celebrating with her kids, right? If they sit down for a meal together, I hope that happens somewhere, they could say, you know, tell me a good thing you saw someone else do today, a mm -hmm. kindness you saw, and tell us a kindness you did. And everybody does a woohoo, right? Woo each time 
they hear a kindness. We all woohoo. We really do do that. <laughs> Even before I knew you, we were woohooing. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so dedicating is a little bit different because dedication means, and I want to send my good seeds not only to the result that I want, mm -hmm. but I send them to a bigger result. I send them, you know, to becoming someone who can set the example for others to live by seeds, or I dedicate them to my world, everybody living by seeds. Where we, the dedication is to send the power of those seeds into something bigger uh, than ourselves. Meta okay. seed sending. Meta seed sending. Perfect. I like it. So if I was to take my coaching hat off and I was to put it on you, give it to you right now, I don't want people listening to the show today without taking an action. What one homework assignment would you give people today? Yeah, I would give people the homework assignment to establish the habit of five minutes a day mm -hmm. of identifying the goodness that they've seen in their world that day. Very specific. I saw someone hold the door open for an old lady, and I'm happy I saw that in my world. And to think of at least one kindness that they especially did that day because they understood about seeds. I, okay, I remembered seeds when I was in the grocery line, and it was so long, and I was waiting, and I was grumbling, and I realized, oh, no, this is just coming from my seeds. I'll take this delay on for everybody. I, I've had the thought. I'm happy I had the thought. I hope I have that thought some more. Woohoo. Okay. I'm rejoicing. I, I would I would try to instill in people the power of rejoicing. Woohoo! Yeah. What yeah. advice, Je Jessica, she, she's the producer. She's my wife. She always wants me to ask, what advice would you give to parents to help their kids with this concept? Yeah. Kids get this concept much easier than parents. They don't need all the logical blah, blah, blah. They go, oh, yeah, and they go right out and eat lunch with the lonely kid, you know, because they get it. Um, again, the advice is to encourage the family, the children and parents together mm -hmm. to establish this rejoicing practice. What a great habit kids could grow up with if part of just like brushing their teeth, you know, and washing their face, they do recall of the ways that they were kind and the ways they saw other people are kind. We it, need a kindness know, channel. <laughs> we do. You know, it's like the our world would change so fast. Bad things would still happen, mm -hmm. of course, but our response to them would be so much gentler on ourselves and others that it wouldn't be long before those bad things would lessen. Awesome. That is a yeah. woohoo. Yeah, our kids can do it. On that note, what personally brings you the greatest happiness or what I call the woohoo factor? Yeah, the woo yeah it's um it 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 really is sharing these concepts, you know, sharing these ideas you know, either in the blah, 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 like this, which is what I seem to do the most. But I also sometimes get the opportunity to work with people one-on-one -on -one, uh, who are in some kind of crisis mode. And uh, to be able to help them un unplug from that old world view and plug in the world view of this crisis is an opportunity to plant a different future. Mm -hmm. It's so satisfying to see their demeanor change as they as they catch on to their power, their own power, right? To change, to switch from victim to to creator is beautiful. I love doing that. Woo! Yeah, thank you. Where can people go to find your beautiful book? Right, sweet. The puppy, the pen, and the chew toy, and find out more. Right. So the this book was published through uh, self publishing Create Space, which is Amazon's mm -hmm. uh, on demand publishing. So you can go to Amazon to find it. However, if you just put in the puppy pen and chew toy, you go to their pet supply store and you can't get out of it. So 
you have to uh, put in the author's name, Sarani Stumpf, and then uh, the title in quotes, and I think you can get there. Can you spell your name for us then? Right. S as in Sam, A R A H, N as in Nancy, I, Stumpf, S T U M as in Mother, P as in Paul, F as in Frank, Sarani Stumpf. Uh, you can also get it from uh, createspacedirect.com, which maybe is a little easier. And then um, I I don't have a a web site, but I have a Sarani Stump Facebook page that uh, will carry on the theme of the book. And uh, it had I have a beautiful a, little girl on it this morning in a little dojo, screaming oh, her heart out. It was awesome. Oh yay! <laughs> Good. I have a wonderful friend who's managing that for me because I'm so techno impaired, but I really appreciate her. And uh, and then my there's a puppy pen chew toy at gmail dot com that is available for people's comments as well. Fantastic. Um, before we dive into a brief meditation, any last words of wisdom you want to share with people? Uh. I, you know, from my heart, I wish that I could just reach into their hearts and turn the dial mm-hmm. from misunderstanding to understanding, you know, and if I, if I could, I would. Uh, but the, the one thing like I could write on a little piece of paper is this, be happy with the goodness you see in your world and be happy with the goodness you see in yourself. Because that's where everything comes from. It's like, please be happy with yourself. Can we add to that? Because it just flows so naturally. Be happy with the goodness you bring to the world. Yes, beautiful. Beautiful. That was right. awesome. Thank yeah, you so good. much, Sharani. Thank this you. has been beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Would you have a brief meditation you wouldn't mind sharing with us? Yeah, it's, you know... Not so much a meditation as just a thought process that we okay. can learn. So if we would just uh, take a deep breath and let it out. And think of one uh, problem that you may be having or one problem that you're seeing in the world today, something specific. For me, maybe it's the divisiveness that I see people criticizing each other. And what's the opposite of that? What's the opposite of the problem you're seeing or you're having? For me, the opposite of divisiveness would be hearing people praise, seeing other people's praises instead of pointing out their faults. And so I, Think specifically today, what can I do today to be that opposite of the problem? So for me, who can I tell something good about someone else? Oh, I have David and I have some, this experience, I can tell him how wonderful Michael was today on this interview. And think to yourself, in my past few days or a week, where is it that I have already praised someone to someone else? Ah, I was at my friend Mary's and I was so appreciative of how her husband helped me. And I was telling her how wonderful he is. And of course she knew it already, but 
I, I'm glad that I said that. And so be happy with that goodness that you've already done that is the opposite of what you're seeing as a problem. I'm happy I praised Mary's husband. I'm happy I praised someone else to that other person. I'm just thinking of other ones. They start popping up. Yeah, I'm glad I did that one too. Be happy with all the goodness that you have inside you. And decide you want to share it with other people. You want to radiate that kindness, that goodness. So that just being with them uplifts them. They'll see you doing that kindness, and it will influence them in this positive way. Feel what that would feel like. This outflow of kindness sharing. And because we're sharing it, more grows inside of us so that we never run out. Everything flowing out from us and always available to flow out from us. And may it be so. Woohoo! Woohoo! So thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Sarani. This is beautiful. You're beautiful. What you're doing is so important in the world today. I hope we can change things. Oh, Thank there's so no much. doubt. There is absolutely no doubt. Great. So, got to crank it back up for the finish. For okay. everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get the puppy, the pen, and the chew toy, and begin planting your own seeds today. Yay. And shine bright. Woohoo! Thank you very much. So grateful to you for what you're doing in the world. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>